Welcome, unprofessionals, to this episode of Unprofessional Development. This week, we will have Matthew Bates. He is another teacher that I know from Quora. He's a teacher from Chicago, and he has lots of fun stories. He's also much more far Quora famous, or far famous, whichever way you like to say it, than me. <laughs> All right. So this week, when we recorded, we used some student names a little too loosely. So what we have done is gone in there and overdubbed the name George whenever we used a student name. If you don't know why we use the name George, please listen to the teaser episode also available in your player, and maybe you'll understand. This week's episode is brought to you by Vomit Sawdust. Mm, we love that sawdust covering up that wonderful vomit. It's also now available in decaf. That doesn't make any sense to you? It'll make more sense after you've listened to this episode. Thank you and enjoy. It's okay ha, to be unprofessional. This is your teacher confessional. Real teachers, the stories are real. You gotta laugh with the disco and meal. E. <laughs> Welcome, unprofessionals, to another installment of Unprofessional Development. I'm Tedisco. And I'm Mealy. And today we've got a guest, Matthew Bates. So um, this will be our third Quora guest. So he is famous on Quora. I've been following him from way back when, when he had a different name. I don't even remember what that name is now, but you had the little, uh, like, martini glass guy. What was his name? Uh, Jamie. Jamie Barth was my first name <laughs> on there, yeah. Jamie yeah. Barth. Jamie Barth. Was there's, was... there's a good story as to why I did that. But go we'll for get to it. That Let's, hear that. Let's hear yeah. that story, and we'll go forward from there. Well, I started writing about um, politics on a different blog, so I didn't come into Cora as, like, a, a teacher writer. It was, it was mostly about politics. And of course, I can get really nasty when you're writing online. So <laughs> I started nasty on the internet. The <laughs> blog, the blog that I had been working on, um, that I had been writing on closed. It was a blog for a progressive radio host. And I was like the lone non progressive there, right. kind of holding my own. And I was really enjoying it. So I went looking for another another place to write. And that's how I found Cora. And I just immediately it's just good you know, we teach our students this too. It's just a good practice to use a fake name online. Yeah. I started using one, not expecting to become popular or anything. I just had some thoughts that I wanted to share. And next thing I know, like I had a hundred followers and 200. And then by the time it, it took about eight or nine months, I got up to 14,000 followers. Wow. And then I was like, well, there were some other things going on. Um, I was spending way too much time on core. I was having way too much fun with it, but it was, I was neglecting things that I was supposed to be doing in the real world instead because <laughs> I'm a guy of extremes. I just decided to cut the whole thing. I emailed uh, the people at Quora. I said, um, I need you to delete my account immediately because when you normally delete it, it's like a two week grace period for you to think about it. And I'm like, I need to not think about this. I need this <laughs> like, I've, I've made this decision and I need this done now. And so part of me emailing them was uh, also me telling them that I had been not using my real name because they have the real name policy. And they were totally cool with it. They deleted it within a day. And then about six weeks later, um, some people that I had kept in touch with that I'd met in Cora, but I had like kept in touch with outside of there, they were encouraging me to come back. And I was like, OK, I can moderate myself now because um, I, I did miss it. Um, so I came back and then the people at Cora were like, well, we're going to need to see your ID at this point. I want to kind of go through what we had here on on the plans and kind of like okay. start from the beginning, even though we've kind of, you know, kind of like a movie. Now we've seen kind of the, the end and now we're going to go back, um, right. flashback for a while, and then we'll maybe we'll catch up to the present and we'll go into the future. Okay. So, <laughs> so like you're an English teacher and you write extensively. So mm -hmm. some of what you write is opinion, but there's also a story element. So I'm curious is there a story from your childhood or is there a movie or somewhere where you really say, hey, here's where story really became a part of my life, both telling stories, reading stories, sharing stories and breaking down stories? 
So um, that actually relates back to when I first started writing about politics as a, like a voyage of self-discovery being the one person in a group of people who thought differently. I realized that a lot of the way I think about politics go goes back to things that happened to me when I was young. And so then uh, as I went on to Cora, because uh, I didn't write like stories about my life or anything, I just spoke politics on the politics blog. Um, but I did realize that because of my size, I'm a big guy. And a lot of the social isolation that I experienced in middle school and high school kind of led me to sort of an isolationist libertarian worldview. Like whenever someone says something, I'm like, well, that sounds like a personal problem. And it's because, <laughs> you know, it, it's because that's what I always felt like that sort of like sense of not me against the world, but me here, everyone else there, everyone's their own little world right. sort of feel. Sorry, that might've been a little deep. I no, that's, that's good. Um, so on Cora, when I started writing politics, every now and then, because you need to for your own sanity, I came up for air and I wrote about <laughs> other things um, from my childhood. And for whatever reason, um, some of those stories really seemed to get a lot of traction, um, particularly when I wrote about my sister and her struggles with addiction. Mm -hmm. I, I would write something about my sister from my childhood, a memory about her and her addiction problems. Or about my father, and people really seem to like that. So I would write more of those because positive feedback is always, always motivational. And then I'd write about my own children and my home life, and it, it became like writing about like life stories like that became the most popular thing I was doing. And politics was like the side thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. and then I started writing about teaching, right? Um, and those became really popular too. Became popular with students. There's like a teenage Cora group uh if you're not yes. aware of it yeah and they they seem to really like what i write there yeah yeah, yeah. And so did you did you like writing when you were young or or is this something you kind of discovered later on so i'm hoping none of my students current students hear this but i despised writing when i was young <laughs> um, i was not an avid reader either i was a video gamer so i i, I teach at a catholic school which still like really presses cursive handwriting uh, I can't read cursive handwriting. And I have to tell my students. Um, I have to tell my students. Can you please just type this or print it out? And um, just yesterday, one of my coworkers told me because uh, I had assigned uh, some homework for my students, uh, and it was a, quite a bit of homework. And they had started it in his class near the end of the day, and he said that they had all agreed to do their answers in cursive just to get under my skin. Oh, um, nice. Which you know what. <laughs> Uh, whatever, you know, um, we're just going to trade and grade anyway, so they're just making their own lives harder. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's not right. that I can't read cursive, but it's like I'm translating it. Um, to it, to answer your curs question. Children's cursive is more challenging than um, like professional cursive as well. Yeah, yeah. It's um, like when I'm flipping through papers that aren't typed and uh, most of them are in print, but then I'll get to that one in cursive and I just have to take a deep breath like, okay. I can do this. Here it goes. <laughs> and then I, and it is like, I'm translating it. Like it's a whole nother language to me. I have to think about every single word, but to answer your question, uh, that's the physical part of writing. Uh, to answer your question. No, I, I wasn't ever really an avid writer um, until I started writing on political blogs. Okay. So, yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean too, about uh, the kids handwriting. Like when, when I have a kid who turns in and they just have sloppy handwriting, like it just looks like they put right. a crayon to a napkin and just went to town. Like right. I can, I can deal with that, but I have some kids, especially like the girls with really gorgeous handwriting and they're, it looks like the declaration of independence from far away. It's just beautiful cursive. I can't read a word of it. I have to kind of take uh, their, their word for it a lot. And I'm glad that, <laughs> um, I'm glad that we do a lot of stuff online. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it, if I wanted to get really lazy, I could actually have it read it out to me. I can just like highlight and be like, <laughs> read, read this to me. Um, So, so kind of want to get also into the more to the Matthew Bates story. And, you know, some of the people, obviously, they're going to listen to us, listen to this. Are, cause some of them are going to be your choir followers, but lots of going to be people who don't know who you are. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So what I know a little bit about you is that you graduated college and you worked in an auto parts store. I don't have the quite timeline on that, but I want to kind of, you kind of talk us through being in the auto parts store and managing the... Um, the proletariat, we shall say, <laughs> that is there, and then how that helped you to become the manager of the middle schoolers, and what's the what's the Venn diagram? So 
I went into the auto parts business two years out of college. Um, while I was in college, I worked with special needs kids. I was like a one-on-one -on -one helper for like the uh, high school boys and who were in wheelchairs and had cerebral palsy and stuff like that. And I worked for a family. And to this day, I, that's the most money I've ever made was working for an individual family who just needed someone to be with their son. He ended up passing away. And then my, I worked for the school system for a little while. But then a friend of mine asked me um, if I could come and work for his auto parts store. He had inherited a mom and pop store. He didn't inherit it. He married into it. He, his wife was the daughter, the oldest daughter of the owner. Uh, he really like, like a Tommy boy really, situation almost, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He, <laughs> um, he, he really lucked out in life because the, the store had an apartment above it that they were given rent free. Okay. Um, so by the time he nice. was 27, he had zero debts. Uh, he had a, an awesome wife and he had a business that was making money hand over fist. And I was like, well, great to be you. I'm but jealous. A good friend of mine. And he called me and he said, he, he told me there's a lot of money coming in and out of this place and he didn't trust anyone. Um, and he asked me to come and work for him. So I did that for a couple of years, but that was like 55, 60, 70 hours a week. And at that point I had gotten married and we already had one kid. And I was like, I need fewer hours than this. Um, so we went our separate ways and I went to walk, work for a retail uh, auto store. Am I allowed to say that I worked at AutoZone? Yeah, sure. Get in the oh, zone, baby. Yeah. All right. Maybe there'll be a sponsor I, one day. Yes. This I got hired straight into a management position at AutoZone. Um, this particular one, because I live in Chicago, uh, this was the biggest one in Chicago. It was the hub store. We had uh, one manager and four assistant managers, whereas a normal store only has one of each. I was one of the four assistant managers. Um, they were training me to be a manager and then eventually like, just to keep working my way up the, up the ladder there. And so I, I worked there for a couple of years. Part about um, being a manager is you have to treat people like adults. And if you don't treat them like adults, they will intentionally act like less than they really are capable of. Mm. Um, so like, I didn't like having to nitpick and tell, tell uh, you know, another person who could even be older than me. I didn't like to have to tell them, hey, can you go clean up that spill that we both just saw? Um, right. I would rather thank them for actually doing it, you know, or just start to do it and see if they, they stopped me and took it, took it over from me. So, yeah, when you get to middle school, and this is a, a struggle here in Chicago because we have K through eight schools. Uh, there are no separate middle schools um, here okay. in the city. Uh, which I wasn't raised here, so I didn't realize how weird that was <laughs> until I got here. Because yeah. um, I teach 14-year-olds who just that morning were sitting next to six-year-olds, you know, waiting for the school to open. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of – there's a problem with some some teachers at the school thinking that everyone at the school is a child, is mm. – uh, is a like eight, nine, 10 year old kid because that's who they work with. And since those other students are there, they must also be like that. And you have to treat the 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds, you have to treat them like, like adults. And part of treating them like adults is letting them fail if they fail. And so that, that was in management too. Like um, if people you know, were to want to leave early or whatever, um, or we're not being very reliable, we would cut their hours. And that would become a problem for them, but it's like, well, that's the decision that you made. You know, right. like we we give out hours uh, the way that it works. Um, we would give like we'd have like two thousand hours that we were able to dish right. out to all the hourly employees, and and they went to the people who were the most reliable. And some of the unreliable ones would complain a little bit, and I'm like, well, you know, like because I was the one in charge of the schedule there. Yeah. I'd be like, well, you know, last last you know last three weeks, I've given you the hours that you wanted, and you keep either calling off or coming in late or leaving early. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? And then, um, so it's the same for middle school. You just treat people like adults, and part of treating people like adults is letting them fail and letting them have consequences. And I think that's something that a lot of um, non middle school te teachers struggle with, like the younger the te the teachers who teach the younger grades. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have to work really hard on at my level is um, stopping the hand holding right. that that the adults keep doing. Like, okay, not the kids yeah. holding each other's hands. No, 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 not no. so. Yeah, I can tell you some stories, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, we still deal with that at the high school level, too. And it, it's, you have to, you know, tell them where the line is, right? They need to know if they're on a path towards failure, right? It shouldn't be a surprise right. to them. But we shouldn't be afraid to, you know, give them a consequence and, and to let them fail if that's the choice they're making. They should feel that consequence. Right. 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 We, um, uh, our trimester, so our report cards come out in a couple of weeks. So it's the time to get the grades in and stuff. And I have students asking me for extra credit, but I'm like, you know, I look at, and I'll tell them when they're misbehaving in class. And I'm like, this is why I'm not giving you extra credit. Look at what you're doing right now. Right. You know? Extra credit is for people who do the first credit the first time around. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's yeah. the word extra. It yes. means on yes. top of the normal. Yeah, and that is. Yeah, that's, I was gonna say that some, is. Some, some students treat it like it's a a substitute. Like I didn't want to do that assignment. Can I do this other assignment? I'm like, no. The extra is for students who did that assignment but didn't do it well, and this will help them out. Yes. Right. And that I was gonna say that's the challenge is, and you're and you're teaching them that as well, not only to fail. But how to get over failure, you know, right. some of them and you need to like find the balance there between teaching them. Sometimes I do it as a class. Sometimes I do it to an individual. Like I have a kid who was struggling and I go around and I talk to all my kids every day as they're, as they're working independently. But some of them need help learning to ask for help. Hmm. Like right. the ones that won't raise their hands or the ones that. One, they are like embarrassed and say, hey, I, I've, I've got that. And then you find out when you grade whatever it is that you're grading for them that, oh, uh, you were lying. Were you lying to yourself? Were you lying to me? And kind of working out that um, challenge um, that we have, that the kids have. And we're all going to fail. So you might as well fail in a safe place where things like, not that they don't matter, but I mean... You know, for the most part in the real world, school's kind of a mulligan, right? Yes. Like, you can fail in school, and you can still, like, build yourself up, right? You're in your, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and you fail like that. You're dealing with major financial issues for the rest of your life, right? Yes. Right. Right. I've I've had to tell some of my coworkers before as they allow students to, like, in the very last week before the report card, make up work that's, like, 10 weeks old at that point. Mm-hmm. And those students have known that they've had all this missing work. I've I've had students who've had like 40 missing assignments. And then my coworkers would be like, yeah, we need to put a packet together so they can finish it this weekend. And I'm like, no, we're doing a disservice to them by not letting them see the consequences of their actions. Right. Um, when they get, when they move off to high school, you know, the the high school teachers aren't going to do that for them. Yeah. So, and yeah. Some, of the, some of them will, but, but also you're, <laughs> you're then training them. And that's why some of the kids go to high go to their high school teachers and figure, you know, I can now do nothing until the last weekend, and then I will get some magic packet that I will take home and, you know, use the internet to finish and then turn it in the next day. And now I've passed this class with no true mastery, and that, mm-hmm. that can that can be the challenge. And, and colleges yeah. look at your high school grades, right? So I mean, if you're gonna fail for that reason. Like long term, it's better to to hit that that wall in middle school, mm-hmm. right? Learn right. it young, and then you know you have more time to to make it part of you. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So we do like to always have some funny parts here. I don't, I don't how many of our you got to listen to, but we do like to uh-huh. have some good funny stories, and you you have I'm sure a couple you can give us here. So whether it's essays that made you um, laugh that you wrote, you can't believe this kid wrote that or something crazy that a kid did or something else that even something that happened on Quora that kind of um, made you laugh. So um, tell us something that's an amusing story. Right, right. So um, I teach at Catholic schools Mm -hmm. and I always have, uh, I did some student teaching in a public school. um, And when I was a special ed assistant, that was in public schools. But other than that, I've taught in Catholic schools. Um, and our students tend to be very sheltered. This was part of the book that I did with um, Consiglio and yep. uh, Leslie and uh, Katie Gold was the other lady's name. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the title of that book again? Um, A Comedy of Classroom Eras. Yes, Errors. That's right. uh, Leslie Barclay. Okay. Uh, she she came up with that title. Her husband did the drawings for it too. I should mention that as well. Awesome. And. And we'll link uh, that can, in the show notes. We'll link it to, oh, to Amazon. Thank you. Uh, that. And, I, consig- and I own a copy, by the way. 
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, You're Consiglio's, welcome. Consiglio's wife did the cover art. Mm-hmm. And also um, Becky Butts, who is now Becky Puckett. Yes. Um, she also did the cover art as well. So okay. I just want to make sure you get all the names in there. Wow. I met Becky. <laughs> I had a 14 year old student and her name was George and she's probably in her, well, she's got to be in her mid twenties by now. This is my first year of teaching. We were reading war of the worlds. And if you've ever read that in that, in that novel, um, uh, there's a red weed that takes over wherever the aliens have landed. It's like the aliens are planting this red weed everywhere. Yeah. So she was doing a PowerPoint presentation on it and she Googled red weed and she included it in her PowerPoint presentation. and everything she gets up there and she's presenting it and as soon as it got to that it's this giant marijuana leaf that happens to be red (laughs) and she was totally oblivious had no idea why half of the class was cracking up and so i i ignored it at the time i was like okay i'm just gonna address this later yeah yeah. no sense making an even bigger scene right so afterwards i was like i pulled over like you know what that was she says no and i was like that's marijuana and then she got really beet red and i'm and I'm trying not to laugh, and I'm like, this poor, sheltered 14-year-old girl mm-hmm. has made it this far in life, living in the suburbs of Chicago, you know, not not having any idea what that was. And she wow. thought she was going to get detention. She <laughs> thought, like, her parents were going to, like, be really angry. But we all had a, a good laugh about it now. So, uh, George, if you're listening to this somehow, um, that was very funny. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it is amazing. We've talked about this multiple times. The things that they don't know. Now, sometimes it surprises you the stuff that they do know, and they make references, you know, and then they also want to know, oh, here's one that happened to me a while back, and now I know, because this kid was making fun of me, because he knew that I didn't know what it meant. meant. Yeah. And he said, got any rips? Do you know what that (laughs) means? No idea. So, in the jewels or the vapes, like, each time you, like inhale that's a rip apparently and so the kids that share you might be running low and you want to know do you have any rips because i just need like you know they're addicted to the nicotine in it so they ask Uh each other got any rips and then they would share whatever so he was just like asking me got any rips and i'm like (laughs) i don't know what that is but i'm gonna find out (laughs) so then i went to one of my you have to have those go-to kids that are your your um Huggy Bear, for those of you that are um, fans of Starsky and Hutch, your your uh, kids that will give you the inside info and go, "Hey, I'm a moron. What's a rip?" Oh, Mr. Miller, you right. don't know what a rip is, and then they tell you what a rip is. More than once, I've had to uh, text my oldest daughter. She's 20 now, mm-hmm. and I had to text her with something that a student just said and be like, um, "What does this mean?" <laughs> and then she'll she'll explain it to me. And then, yes. Okay, that 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 passes, or no, I need to talk to the student about that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm right. always proud when I learn new slang words. Are you? Yeah. I was, uh, it was years ago. I was talking to somebody and I just learned a new new slang word. And I was like, oh man, I, I found out this word. And they're like, what? It was like, guap. And they're like, <laughs> guap, for those of you at home, uh, a guap is a pile of money. You got like a bunch of money, you got guap. And so I was like, guap. And he goes, Psh, guap is cheddar. And I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, you know, lettuce. I was like, I don't, do you have a, are you making a sandwich? He goes, I got a sandwich in my pocket right now. And I was like, look, I know we're exchanging words right now, but communication is not happening. Right. So, ooh, I've got, that That reminds me. This is a good one. <laughs> so, they pulled one over on administration. Okay. Are either of you familiar with what the term ratchet means? Yes, yes I know what that means. Okay. So, ra- ratchet, for those of you who don't know, means basically ghetto, mm-hmm. all right? But they had convinced the student council person who was in charge that ratchet meant uh, tacky. <laughs> so, we literally had, during Spirit Week, no, we had Ratchet Day. No. We did. <laughs> they announced it over the announcements. No. It's going to be Ratchet Day. And so... Like, and they explain, like, oh, ratchet, like tacky. And I'm like, I didn't know. I'm like, oh, ratchet means tacky. Okay. So I dressed like I mismatched my socks and I, like, was all, you know, I was in the spirit. I dressed all crazy. So my job that year, my duty was uh, 
at the traffic circle where the kids are getting unloaded from their parents dropping them off, the car riders. So every kid that got out. I'm not okay with this story. Just, we can end it now. All right, <laughs> every keep going. kid that got out. Didn't matter what they were wearing, because I was just being goofy, and I was obviously just, I'm like, yo, that, like, you look so ratchet today. And, they, oh. <laughs> and they're looking at me, like, what is this guy doing? What's wrong with him? Why would he say that to me? They were looking, like, offended, and I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, all those shoes are so ratchet. And, like, no, like, I just said ratchet literally to, like, I don't know, 75 kids. <laughs> <laughs> in the course of like 30 minutes oh, and then like no. later on like someone's like mr mealy do you know what ratchet means i'm like yeah it means tacky look i'm dressed all ratchet They're like no no ratchet no, it's ghetto like that means that they are poor and that they are just can't afford it that they are just so nice i mean i don't, I don't know yeah, it means ghetto i don't know another a nice word for ghetto uh, uh, it comes from wretched <laughs> Yeah, so you have to be careful sometimes when you adopt you, those. You do. <laughs> but I think I got pulled over on an admin. Ever since then, I think that all um, spirit days after that had to like be submitted much more in advance with admin <laughs> approval. God. You weren't there then for Ratchet Day. You missed Ratchet Day. I, I before your time. Must have. Back in the BC, before Chris. Can I back it up and tell another funny story? Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. Okay. This was another very, very sheltered girl, a uh, different girl. This was George. If you're listening to this, you're probably about 25 or 26 at this point, and I hope everything worked out for you. Um, <laughs> she was 13 or 14 at the time. I had her class right after after their recess. Um, so she came in, and everyone settled down. And as soon as everyone was settled down, she raises her hand, and she says, Mr. Bates, why do the boys keep calling you Master Bates nice. on, the, on the playground? Oh, no. And, of course, the boys started cracking up. They had put her up to it because she had no, no idea what that word meant. Oh, like, no idea. No. So I was like, George, we can't talk about this right now. You should ask your parents later. Oh. And then she said, no, I don't understand. What's so funny about it? And of course, the boys were rolling at this point. And I yes. was like, just drop it and talk to your parents about it later. I managed to get everyone back under control. I never did answer a question for her. Right. But yeah. that, so I don't that know how you afternoon, would. No, 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 no. Uh, that after, and I didn't tell her to look it up either because <laughs> they had, they had a uh, MacBooks, and I was like, just talk to your parents. Right. Um, <laughs> Smart. Smart. Uh, so she, uh, I got an email by about 4.30 that afternoon. So she must have gotten straight home and asked her mom. And the email was from her mom saying that, apologizing. Um, saying that her daughter was mortified and that her daughter had run to her room and locked herself in and was crying. Oh, and, <laughs> poor kid. Crying that the boys had put her up to it. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I was like, oh, you know, I emailed the mom back. I was like, tell her it's fine. That's, believe it or not, that's not the first time I've heard that in my right. life. <laughs> it come, comes along with having that last name. Um, the next day she came in and she had a handwritten apology note. And I was like, okay, just like right. get over it and move on and learn from this. Yes. Yeah. She was a very sheltered, sheltered student, yeah. Catholic school student. What a sweetheart, yeah. though. Like, yes. that's, oh, yeah. man. Yeah. And so, um, go ahead. Uh, if is listening to this, George, you know you're the one that put her up to that. Wow. Um, <laughs> and Call him out. I only hope, I hope that everything worked out for you. So, yeah. <laughs> did George get any consequences or did you, did you, um, he, he was funny, but he knew when, he knew when to stop. So it was like the teachers appreciated his kind of humor, mm -hmm. kind of funny. Right. Um, it wasn't like uh, malicious or anything. Right. So we never for sure knew that it was him. Mm -hmm. um, I just know in my heart that it was him because <laughs> of what I know what I, what I know about him. My right. teacher so, sense is yeah. tingling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We really appreciate the stories about the um, the master baits and the, um, <laughs> the uh, what you call them the, the the red weed. Are there any essays that you can recall that I read this essay and this kid was just just really hysterical? Maybe maybe intentionally, maybe um, unintentionally, because I can't you know you read I can't imagine how many essays um, a year. I have some standing rules now. It's actually written in my classroom. Uh, if you're if we're doing creative writing or something. Uh, for the where the students are allowed to share, um, the first rule is make sure it's school appropriate, and the second rule is please don't overshare. 
because we're going to share these with the class. Right. Um, and I had to do that because students were writing wildly over the top things. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, because, uh, you know, middle schoolers don't always have a filter like that. Um, one student, right. I had asked, uh, what was your worst injury? You know, like just something to write about, fill up a page, the worst injury you've ever had or the most sick you've ever ha been or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this student wrote an entire page about having to get stitches in his private parts, although he didn't call it that, um, because he fell when he was five years old and he still had a scar. And oh. he was very graphic about it. And oh. I, I, I called him up and I hadn't read it before I called him up because I was oh. like, all right, let's share. And then I pull a paper out at random and he started to share it. And of course, everyone was like laughing and stuff. And I don't know if he meant it to be funny or not. But at the same time, I had, to, I had to stop in midway, and I was like, all right, that's enough of that. We'll move on to the next person. And then I had to put these rules in, like, no oversharing, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. Do you now yeah. use that as an example when you when you explain oversharing, or do you, or do you leave that out? Um, I leave that out. Um, that kid that is out. probably about 21 at this point, so I hope everything worked out for him. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mantra. That's a good one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, let's. Well, I mean, it's not the exact same thing, but it, it, like I said, we, we come back to this time and time again. The things that you have to um, explain to kids, and I always explain to kids at the beginning of the year that, you know, we go through like the expectations and the rules. Like, okay, if you need to go to the bathroom, the pass is over here, and you ask me, and only one kid can go to the bathroom at a time. I'm like, but if you have to vomit, and you're having trouble getting my attention. Just leave. Like, run out the door and do not vomit in my classroom yep. while you couldn't get my attention. I'm like, I will probably yell at you and go, where are you going? What are you doing? I said, ignore me and proceed to hell and vomit because I had a teacher Once friend. Once you're done with your expulsions, right. come back. I had a teacher friend that this kid literally came up, you know. And like, can I, like all over, oh, no. all over the shoes oh, and no. the pants. And I'm like, really? We teach high school. That happened to you? And then and they like, wrote an essay because that's the worst injury they've yeah, ever had. That's, I mean, and it's, I'm like, I don't want to have to deal with that, you know? I also, this, and you'll, to this, you know, I'm, I, it's called unprofessional development mostly because I'm the most unprofessional one around here. <laughs> but I tell kids, I'm like, and like, honestly, if you're going to have some kind of an issue, where you think you might die, I said, please, like, go to the bathroom and do that, or out in the hall, because I don't have to fill out the paperwork if you die in my classroom. Like, that's just <laughs> too much trouble for me. All so the please. paperwork. Yeah. Yes. I've never had to do that, thankfully, but can you imagine how much paperwork you'd have to go? I, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> so, so let's, let's kind of segue oh, into wait. the... What? Were you going to say something? I am... Um... I made it eight years as a teacher, not knowing there's a utility closet where I work. And I thought for the longest time that the bags that were in there were coffee because they look like coffee bags. And I never, you know, I thought, well, that's weird. Why would you put coffee bags in the utility closet? Whatever. Um, and then one day, finally, eight years into teaching, uh, a kid threw up all over my classroom, hit the air conditioner and everything. It was, I was like... That kid and his name was George. And I'm like, I don't know how you did this um, <laughs> so much. Um, of course, I had to get everyone else out of the room. Right. And then uh, one of my coworkers hands me this bag of coffee. And I was like, why are you handing me coffee right now? And then I looked at it and it was the sawdust. <laughs> and I was like, oh. oh, this is the smelly sawdust I remember from when I was a kid. <laughs> and they still do this. So I had to spray it all around. I needed two bags. And then they had to call the janitor and everything. And the janitor was like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time downstairs with the little kids. And I was like, this is the first time it's ever happened up here for me. So, yeah. Wait, uh, it was Have you had someone throw up? No. Not, not well, yes, but he made it to the uh, uh, garbage can. Um, but my first year teaching, I had, um, I had a boy who uh, we were reading out of the textbook. So the textbook's open on his desk, oh. right? And I'm trying to read and I'm trying to teach. And uh, um, I hear this one kid saying, yo, George is leaking. And I'm like, oh, what? Like, George is leaking. And, like, I think it, I thought, like, okay, maybe he's crying or something. I'm like, well, let's not draw attention to it. Let's just move on. All right, we got to get through this lesson on whatever it is we're reading. And this kid stands up and goes, no, George is leaking. And I look over. This kid has a bloody nose. 
but is not going to like stop it or hold it. He's just letting it drip down his face onto the textbook oh. to the point that it's starting to like puddle and splash. Oh. So yeah, I gotta take the whole class out. They gotta bring people in to talk to the kid and figure out what's going on and why he's not stopping his nose from bleeding. And then we get to this other classroom and I sit everybody down. I'm like, open up your textbooks. I don't like, you don't have a lesson plan ready for that. Oh. <laughs> that makes, speaking of leaking, okay. David Dubrow. I, now, this is when I was in school. I was in first grade, which is a million years ago, but I can still remember this. So we went up to, um, somehow, for some reason I feel like it was our class, but I don't know what class it was. But David Dubrow was in the class with me. And we had to go up to the teacher because the teacher had a stapler on their desk. And first graders aren't very good at stapling, apparently. Nope. <laughs> David Dubrow stapled right through his fingernail into his finger. <laughs> At which nope. point, nope. the reaction of the first grader is to pee himself. <laughs> so, like, I'm standing next to him, and first uh, that happens, and the next thing you know, there's a puddle on the floor. So, poor, and, uh, like, the teacher just sends him to the nurse. I have no idea. How do you the triage? Fact that our species got past the ice age is honestly fascinating. <laughs> how, do you, how do you triage that when it comes to the nurse? Do we handle the, the staple in the fingernail first, or do we handle the wet pants first? I don't know. Oh my! I'm mean, gonna get a school God. nurse in here and have and have. That's we really do need to get a school nurse as a guest, by the way. Oh, that, that's gonna be, be good. But that was yeah, that was good, good stuff. Oh. But oh boy. Okay, so. Um, so, Matthew, uh, Mr. Bates, um, yes. I also want to help you uh, promote you, even though we only have, like, you know, a fair amount of listeners here. But you are now also on something called Medium. So give yes. us, like, the um, elevator pitch for Medium. The elevator pitch is they pay their writers. Um, <laughs> so you get better content. I mean, I'm biased. Of course, I'm extremely biased. I had tried on medium so about two years ago when my books came out um the first book which i did with habib fanny which dave mentioned in last week's podcast mm -hmm. i've never actually met habib i've never even spoken on the phone with him <laughs> um, we did that all just through chat and through google docs and and everything um, but we had a good time with it and it was way more successful than i thought it would be um so that's what spawned the second book really quickly so um in case habib is listening to this what had happened was I had done it, it was under my account on Amazon with their direct press Kindle direct press thing uh, the ebook stuff and so every time we got I got paid for it I would just give him his half and I you know did that for a couple of months and then the sales dropped down and I totally forgot that I was gonna have to pay taxes on all that um, so oh. if Habib is listening to this the reason why I haven't sent him his half lately is because I'm still in the hole here <laughs> um, so Sorry, I ended up babe. losing money on that, but that's you know whatever. We had a good time. I had paid for the program to make the ebooks. It was it was a little bit of an expensive program. It's my hobby, so I, I don't really care. You know, like right. there's more expensive hobbies out there. Um, so I used that to do the second book, and I've been thinking about a third book. But for a while there, a couple of years ago, I thought I was going to quit teaching and just be a writer. I th you know, like everything was looking up, and I was like, I can really do this. I was doing some online lessons too with uh, people I'd met through Quora. Uh, I was doing like book clubs and stuff. And I was like, this would be so much fun. And then those plans kind of fell by the wayside. Some other things happened in my life and, and I stuck with teaching, which I'm glad I did. But I, I tried getting on Medium back then and I couldn't find an audience. I would write stuff. I was on it for about three or four weeks and I didn't have any traction at all. No one was reading my stuff, which kind of sucks when you write something and no one reads it if you're writing it intending for people to read it. Right. Um, it's not like I was keeping a diary or anything. Right. And um, so then I forgot all about it. And about two months ago, another very, very popular Corin, and I don't think he gave me permission to mention his name, so I won't mention okay. who. He messaged me. He, re he reached out to me. He's like, you got to get over here on Medium because he had told me that he was making money hand over fist over there so much so that he had actually quit his job to do that all day. And he had known from years earlier that that was something I was interested in. I'm not really interested in anymore. I like my job and I've found a happy space there. But anyway, he got me over on there and I have been writing there uh, a little bit more, probably two or three posts a week. It's different because you don't have to answer a question. 
you can just write whatever's on your mind. And uh, I, I've been getting a little bit of traction there. I have a little over 400 followers, so mm-hmm. at least someone is reading what I'm writing. Yeah, at this point. yeah I've read, I think, a couple of them. Yeah, and um, I'm able to link those answers over to Quora, so I get more of a following there. Editors at Medium, so they they're um, they have like cultivation editors who like pick things to go on their homepage and stuff. Okay, uh, they've reached out me out to me a few times um, to put my stuff like on their homepage, which which really helps out. That's cool. That's so cool. yeah, okay. I mean I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's 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 nice to get paid. <laughs> yeah, it definitely well, is. It definitely is. Yeah, and we're not talking like quit my job levels of money, right. but definitely like you know maybe uh, maybe I'll get the guacamole on my chips this time. <laughs> <laughs> what is the? What, do, you, do you know how it works? What's the breakdown in terms of like how how does the actual pay to write work for someone that's maybe listening and be interested in how that works? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't know how it works because <laughs> when I look at what has paid me the most. Um, it's not, doesn't seem to be related to how many people read it, how many people liked it, how long they spent reading it. I'm like, I have no idea why this is making so much money. I've had one story, a story about, uh, a true story about, um, my dad, uh, and, so, uh, what I saw happen to him at my sister's funeral. Um, but I've made over a hundred dollars on that story. Whereas, and that didn't take me that long to write. But that's not my most viewed story. My most viewed story on there was um, something about like how the women in my life are always saying that I should feel free to cry. And I'm like, I don't cry. Like, please quit giving me permission to cry because <laughs> that's just not how it how it works for me. And it's not like me being my you know, macho or anything. It's just not how my emotions right. manifest. So anyway, that's had the most views for me by far. And I've made like 30 cents off of that. So I, I really have no idea how how they calculate it. Okay, interesting. So they use yeah. it's math. It's just they uh, math it, and then yeah. math happens, and then I numbers come out. I yeah, don't know. I have some no sort idea. Of wizard involved or something, <laughs> and some sort of a spinning of a wheel, yes. or random numbers. Crystal ball. There's no telling. Okay. Well, again, thank you, thank you so much yeah. for taking your time out and being on here. I really enjoyed this. I know you were um, very humble about, like, how good you would be and engaging and all that, but it's, it's been a blast. We really enjoyed it. I hope you had a good time um, yeah. doing this and it didn't feel uncomfortable or whatever. And so just because you want to add anything to that. I had a lot of fun. This okay. Great. So cool. um, we appreciate it. Well, thank yeah. you. And um, uh, for people who want to find you, uh, where can they find you? I'm on Quora. I'm Matthew Bates 27 somehow. Um, I can't believe there are 26 other Matthew Bates out there that managed <laughs> okay. to get on there before me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and on Medium, I'm Matthew Bates 773. Okay, awesome. And then we'll um, put links again like that in the show notes, and we'll put links to the Amazon books and all of that good stuff. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Unprofessionals, for listening to another one of our fabulous episodes. We appreciate you listening. We also appreciate you sharing this podcast with all your friends, family, whatever. You can share it on social media. You don't need to socially distance on the social media, just in person. Alrighty, and speaking of social media, we are on the Twitter at UnProCast. We are also available for you to email us at unprofessionaldevelopmentcast.gmail.com at gmail.com. Sorry. Please share with us funny teacher stories, any kind of feedback you have for us. If you know some funny teachers, please put them in touch with them. We can always use funny teacher guests. And again, thank you and have a great day.